Shalom. You know what day it is. We're here again. It's Wednesday Word Study. And this time, we're going to take a look at the word bless upon request. Now, this will be a two-part study because there are two different uh, words for our English word bless that, um, well, just looking at them in the scriptures, you wouldn't know based upon the English. Uh, but back to our word bless. I do want to read to you quickly out of Let This Mind Be In You, and this is by Brad Scott, um, Hebrew scholar, Greek scholar, both of a, a linguist background. And here's what he has to say on the Greek view of blessings and cursings. Now, I think this is crucial to understand because in our culture today, we kind of loosely use that word bless. Uh, for instance, when someone sneezes, we say bless you. Or we always say in respect to other people when we're ending a conversation or um, um, our, uh, uh, our farewells, we say shalom and may Yahweh bless you. We always say bless. Do we overuse that? Is that word ha has that word been redefined in uh, today's culture, our setting here today? Because like I said, we use that word very loosely. So according to Brad, this is the Greek view of blessings and cursings. In Greek thought, uh, to be blessed is to receive from the gods favorable conditions in war, weather, uh, and finances are to be blessed by the gods or mighty ones. When a military leader is promoted, he is blessed. When financial rewards are reaped, this too is considered a blessing. Now to be cursed, however, is to lose the battle or fall into financial ruin. So when something occurs which is seen as being negative, this is viewed as a curse. And curses could be turned into blessings by a change in attitude towards their mighty ones or their gods. So the curses of, um, I don't want to get into what a demiurge is, but if you know it, great. Otherwise, we can study that another time. But he says the curses of a demiurge could be reversed through proper adoration. Simply put, blessings are equivalent to good things happening and curses are equivalent to bad things happening. Does that sound very familiar in our modern day? Um, you find a couple of hundred bucks in a parking lot <laughs> and you're like, oh, I'm blessed. Or you just like receive a promotion in your job place, your workplace, you feel blessed or favored, you know? So we can also use those terms in very similar scenarios. Now this is what he has to say on the Hebrew view of blessings. In Hebrew thought, blessings are connected with obedience uh, and curses with disobedience. And they are seen to be linked to good or bad circumstances. Or, I'm sorry, they are not seen to be linked to good or bad circumstances. So, in other words, blessing comes at the moment of obedience. And so it is with the curse. Uh, something good or bad happening could be the result of a myriad of circumstances, totally unrelated to recent obedience or disobedience. Really good book. Thanks, Brad, for writing that. And... So the Hebrew verb barak means to kneel as seen in Genesis 24 verse 11. And we'll look at that once we get on screen. However, when written in uh, the PL form, which is a verb conjugation format, it means to show respect, usually translated as our word bless, as seen in Genesis uh, 12 verse 2. And a related Hebrew word is barakah, and it means a gift or a present. So from this, we can see uh, the concrete meaning behind the PL form. And I don't want to get into these different verb conjugations, but I believe that they were understood in the times anciently. But when we do get behind that form of the verb barak, it is to bring a gift um, to another while kneeling out of respect. And the extended meaning of this word is to do or uh, give something of value to another. And so Elohim, in turn, respects us by providing for our needs, if you will, and uh, we, in turn, respect Elohim in giving Him of ourselves 
as his servants. In turn, being obedient to his word, just as Deuteronomy chapter 28 states about the blesses and the curses. And what are they for? The blessings are for obedience to his word. The cursings were oftentimes due to rebellion or backsliding or disobedience. So while myself, I prefer to use the uh, concrete definitions of Hebrew words, in no shape or form am I uh, not implying that the ancient Hebrews were not void of any abstract thought. By any means am I saying that. On the contrary, however, the Hebrew language is filled with abstract thought. It's just, um, what am I trying to say? It's, it's, it's the difference between the way the Hebrew and the Greek is abstractly, if that makes sense. You kind of got to understand a bit about their mindset and their culture, their, their lifestyles. Uh, Hebrew ab abstracts are definitely related to something concrete, while uh, Greek abstracts are not. And so there's a whole lot that we could actually take from this study of blessing. And I'm not trying to say that when I do these videos that my view is the absolute correct view. No, I'm just trying to give you a perspective or a different angle that you can look at. So a blessing uh, from Greek thought is a pure abstract one with no foundation um, in the concrete whatsoever. But you see from a Hebraic perspective, uh, a blessing uh, is, you know, any action or object uh, that is presented out of respect for another. And so I hope that given this little bit of information, it will help you see um, what it means scripturally, uh, what a blessing is. Because like I said, it is thrown around so loosely that um, I think it's certainly lost its meaning in today's culture. So let us get on screen and we'll check out these scriptures I have for you that we can look at. And uh, this will again be a part one of a part two series on this word, bless. Shalom, let's go on screen. There we go, okay. So here we are, we're on screen and I got my handy notes right here. Um, Genesis 12, two, as I said before, this is what we uh, were looking at, but I didn't give it on screen. I wanted you to see it. So Genesis chapter 12, now Yahweh had said unto Abram, uh, get thee out of uh, thy country. Well, I'm not going to read it to you from the King James. I'll let you read it on screen, but I'm going to read it from the scriptures here. And it says that, And I shall make you a great nation, and bless you, and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. Now you can see here that, um, well, I was reading verse 1, my apologies. Uh, verse 2, And I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. You can see that the word bless is Strong's Hebrew number 1288, and that is our word Barak. And then we got blessing. Strong's Hebrew number 1293. Now they're both cognately related. 1293 comes from 1298. 1293 is Barakah. Barakah, uh, Barak, Barakah ends in the pictographic form of the little man with his arms raised, which is the hay. Uh, now that's the feminine form of the word there. And the reason why he shall be a blessing is because it's a blessing that people will receive. And that's why that word is put in the feminine form. Also, prophetically, the hay attached to the end of a word can uh, mean something in the future, something of perfect, propheticness. Uh, Genesis 24, verse 11 was the other one we looked at. So this one says that, And he made his camels kneel down outside the city by a fountain of water at evening time, the time when women go out to draw water. So you see here, and he made his camels kneel down. The word kneel down, 1288, Barak. So if I could show you here, uh, kneeling down as such, like whenever you go to propose uh, to your soulmate, what have you, to ask to be taken in marriage, uh, you're kneeling down out of honor and respect to that young woman or whatever, to that woman, I should say. Okay. And then another example. And these are, uh, these examples are, every, are everywhere. And I wanted to bring this book to show y'all 
oh goodness, you're only gonna be able to see on that little tiny screen, I forget. So this is the Englishman's Hebrew Concordance of the Old Testament. Uh, this right here is backwards to the Strong's. So the Strong's will show you uh, every instance where an English word is located and give you the Strong's number. You take that Strong's number, you look at it in the Englishman's Hebrew Concordance, and what it does is it'll give you everywhere in the scriptures that Hebrew word is used. Um, excuse me, that Strong's Hebrew number. And then it'll show you how it's translated differently each time in that passage. So it'll take 1288, if that's the one you're looking up, and it'll show you all of its usages and the word that they chose to translate for it in English. So really, really great tool. Um, okay. We're going to look at kneel down 1288. Barak, we have the bait, the resh, and the calf. And you'll see the brown driver Briggs describes this to bless, kneel, to kneel, to bless, to be blessed, bless oneself, it's still pretty abstract, to cause, to kneel, uh, to pray, salute, curse, to bless oneself. Uh, the Strong's definition says it's a primitive root to kneel by implication to bless Elohim as an act of adoration and vice versa, man as a benefit also by euphemism to curse Elohim or the king as treason. Total King James occurrences, we got 331 times and it'll list all those. Now this is for the root word, Barak. We can go back and look at Barakah, but let's look at it in Jeff Benner's Ancient Hebrew Lexicon of the Bible. So we see we have uh, Barak right here, and then we've got the bait, the resh, and the calf, and its action is to kneel. Concretely means knee, just like we read in uh, 2 Chronicles 6.13. For Solomon had made a bronze platform five cubits long and five cubits broad and three cubits high, and had put it in the midst of the court. And he stood on it and knelt down on his knees before all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands toward the heavens. So here we, it's like a play on words. We've got Barak Barakah. He's kneeling down on his knees. So that's the same Hebrew word just as it is in the English, kneel, knees. So we see the action and the concreteness. Now the abstract out of this is the word bless here. The bending at the knee to drink from a pond or present a gift. So as I was describing earlier, kneeling down on my knee to present a gift. And I don't expect y'all to see my little gestures here that I'm doing on this tiny cam, but... Um, this is what it means to present something an offering of the hand now to actually break these letters down here so if we look at section v underneath kneel to bend the knee to kneel in homage or to drink water also the extended idea of presenting a gift or giving honor to another so in essence barak a bait and a resh and a calf now this three letter root comes from actually a two letter root of the bait and the resh. And I don't know if this has any type of relationship, but I automatically thought of sun because of bait resh in Aramaic is bar, and that's sun, um, kind of unique. But however, in the Hebrew it's ben, so that's neither here nor there. But it does imply the responsibility of the firstborn of the house. Now why do I say that? Because if you think in Hebrew culture, what was the father to do? the firstborn son would receive a double portion to take on the role as the provider, as the continuance of the family, right? So you have the bait, which is the picture of that tent floor plan there, and it represents uh, the house or family or in the house with the family. And you have the resh, which is the picture of a head of man. And it means first, top, or beginning, and then you have the calf, which is the open palm. It can mean offering, tame, allow, bend, give. And so the bait and the resh um, signifies just that, that it's the offering from the top. So you have the chief leader, the, uh, the father of the household, passing down the responsibility and the double portion to the firstborn son, the double blessing, right? We see uh, Elijah, Elijah, Elijah to Elisha giving him a double blessing. Um, and you'll see this type of theme, or uh, a double portion, I'm sorry, for a double blessing. So 
I, what I challenge you is to rethink uh, how we mean when we say this word, may Yahweh bless you, because that's the priestly blessing. May Yahweh bless you and keep you. May His face shine upon, shine upon you. May He ha I can't even quote that. Wow, I'm butchering it. Let's just go to it. Numbers. Because this word is Barak is where this is used. Okay, so uh, let's go into the scriptures. Yahweh bless you and guard you. Yahweh make His face shine upon you and show favor to you. May Yahweh lift up His face upon you and give you shalom. Thus they shall put my name on the children of Israel, and I myself shall bless them. This is the word Barak. And oftentimes you'll hear a lot of people speak this blessing over an assembly, a congregation, or children, whoever. And so what does it mean, Yahweh bless you? Yahweh provide you with the responsibility to Shema. Shemar is that word guard. Yahweh bless you and keep you. So the responsibility that comes down to a person that's in covenant with Yahweh to be entrusted, to receive the offering from Yahweh, to have this uh, salvation or deliverance for those that endure to the end, if you will, that shall be rescued, in the words of Yeshua. Um, let, let that guard you. Like, stand firm, be steadfast, and, you know, let this be a re renewal cleansing for you each time. Like, let this be your, your blessing. Because um, that's Him showing respect to the people. In essence, Him coming down off His throne here to sacrifice Himself for the sins of mankind. That is a true blessing. And for us to receive that, receive the blessing, Barakah, we take that in. We take that in an adoration and respect. We are His servants in return. So Yahweh make His face shine upon you and show you favor. Lift up His face upon you and give you shalom. Thus, they shall put My name on the children of Israel, and I Myself shall berakah, bless them. Hope you have found this uh, interesting. And be on the lookout for part two as we look at the other word for the word in English, bless. <laughs> but in Hebrew, it's asher, ashar. And I'll give you a sneak peek. You'll see this. In Psalm 1 1, blessed is the man who shall not walk in the counsel of the wrong, and shall not stand in the path of sinners, and shall not sit in the seat of scoffers. You'll also see it in Psalm 119. Blessed are the perfect in the way who walk in the Torah of Yahweh. Blessed are those who observe his witnesses, who seek him with all the heart. And guess where else you'll see this? You'll see our Messiah. Matthew 5, verse 2. Or verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit because theirs is the reign of the Shemaim or the reign of the heavens. Blessed are those who mourn because they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek because they shall inherit the earth. Each time he says that word blessed there, that's not Barak like you think it would. And if you look at your strongs and look at the times Barak and Ashar are used, Remember, those are the two Hebrew words that are used for the word, English word bless. Uh, you'll see Strong's Hebrew number 1288, that's Barak, used predominantly. It's very interesting why our uh, Messiah chose to use Ashar and why we saw that in the Psalms. So until then, uh, keep on the lookout, like the video, leave your comments below, let me know what you think, let me know what word study you want to hear next or want to see done next or what... Uh, phrase of scripture you want to see interpreted next. In the meantime, have a blessed Shabbat coming up this weekend, and may Yahweh bless you. Shalom.